Is it possible to, on the other hand, to speed things up? In other words, what I've shown is I uh, am able to implement a filtering at a certain rate. What if I want to run a faster filter? Right? Among these two architectures that I've shown, clearly the first architecture, the direct form one, is overall faster. It is capable of processing samples faster for the simple reason that the sample rate is equal to the clock rate. Yes, there is this long critical path to take care of, but in general, I don't have the overheads associated with, you know, all the other counter and the memory and so on. Okay, so it's very likely that this architecture is going to be faster. But if I ask you the question, how do I make this overall thing process samples even faster? Right? Pretty much the only thing that I can do in this case is somehow reduce the critical path. Right? Let's say I go to a smaller technology node, it would mean that I actually can process individual samples uh, the propagation delay would be lower on each of the hardware units, okay? But in general, that's the hardest thing to do, right? I mean, that's not something in the control of any individual engineer. That's a huge call to be taken at, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's a major decision for any company to change technologies. Now, on the other hand, I could also have architecture changes. There is something called the direct form two architecture Right, which I'm not going into over here, but which has a much shorter critical path. Right? So the direct form 2 basically will have a critical path equal to just TM plus TA, right? which is much less than the TM plus N minus 1 into TA of the direct form 1. Right? Another thing that can be done in order to reduce the critical path would be to reduce the number of bits. Let's say that I was using 32-bit numbers for each of the computations. Whereas, uh, and instead I somehow managed to reduce it to 16 bit numbers, right? The critical path associated with each individual unit, multiplier or adder, for a 16 bit number multiplication or addition is going to be significantly less than for a 32 bit uh, multiplication or addition. Okay. Now, what do I lose? You remember the discussion of what happens as we do quantization with a certain number of bits? I lose precision, which means basically that I am more affected by noise. Okay, So bit width reduction is definitely another alternative that I can use in order to come down and bring down the number of uh, the, uh, the critical path. There is a third option, which is pipelining, which we will get to later. Right? That's a fairly significant transformation at the algorithm, uh, at the architecture level. And we will spend some time on how pipelining can be done. Now, you could also come up with a totally different algorithm for doing filtering, an example being FFT-based convolution. Right? And FFT-based convolution, especially for large filters with a lot of taps, is probably going to be more efficient than doing the complete convolution the way that the equation is defined. Okay? But there is yet another method, right, which we can broadly classify as parallelism that I want to touch upon over here just to sort of complete the discussion of what kind of architectures can be used for a simple filter. So what would a parallel FIR filter look like? The idea is simply this. Once again, I have my inputs coming in at some sample frequency, sample rate. Okay. And this is effectively, a, you know, I can call it a demultiplexer. Right? All that it's doing is the first sample will be sent here, another sample will be sent here, then here. And that's one way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it is that I basically put it into some kind of a big memory block and each of these FIR filters can basically pull out the data that it needs. It's basically going to create a bank of registers out here. Okay. And the FIR filters will then be able to take exactly the samples that they need and start processing them. Okay. So from that point of view, especially if these are FIR filters, Effectively, one way of looking at it is to say that each of these filters will be responsible for generating, let's say, y of n. This will be responding, uh, responsible for y of n minus 1. And this will be responsible for some y of n minus, in this case, p, p plus 1. Okay? So that is assuming that there are p such elements out here. Okay? Now, 
if you look carefully, you will notice that if I actually did the demultiplexing, as I mentioned over here, which is to say that I sent the x of n to the first filter, x of n minus uh, x of uh, x of zero to the first filter, x of one to the second filter, and so on, that messes up my filtering. So that is not uh, you know I will I will not get the correct results. So in practice, that is not what you will have to do. The way to implement this would actually be that you need to have some kind of a memory block which stores all of these values, right? And each of these FIR filters, the important thing is each filter only computes one output. Okay, so the first filter only computes y of n, the second filter only computes y of n minus one, and so on, right? Or uh, actually, let me just clarify that. A better way of putting it would be let's say that I compute y of zero over here, then y of one over here, and y of p minus one over here, right? assuming that the samples are numbered from 0, 0, 1, 2, 3 and so on. The question becomes, what is the second output? That needs to be generated by the first filter. Right? And that is essentially going to be y of p. And if you go through the loop and look at it, you will see that the next value this generates is going to be y of 2p, y of 3p, and so on. Okay. In other words, the first FIR filter only needs to generate one sample, one output sample for every p input samples that were received. Okay. The second one will generate y of 1, y of p plus 1, y of 2p plus 1, and so on. The last one will generate y of p minus 1, y of 2p minus 1, y of 3p minus 1, and so on. Okay, so what this tells us is that each one of these, these multiple FIR filters, right, is taking in an input. There is some kind of a serial to parallel conversion happening over here, right, and some kind of parallel to serial conversion happening over here, right? which basically allows each of these to operate at a clock frequency, which is the input sample rate divided by P. Why am I saying that? Because effectively, the, it needs to produce an output only once in every P input clock cycles, okay? which means that it can have a much longer critical path and still operate successfully. So this is an example where the FC, the internal clock rate that could be used for these FIR filters can be much lower than the sample rate. Okay. So the whole purpose of this example was to show that in principle it is possible to have a sample rate which is greater than the clock rate as well. Right? You could also do some mixing and matching. Right? You could have some number of uh, internal filters, each of these itself is a hardware resource shared. So this is a shared resource filter of the type seen here, okay? Which means that it actually takes n clock cycles in order to complete or uh, p clock cycles in order to complete one operation. So the clock frequency over here has to be n times the internal frequency, which means that there are n clock cycles required in order to complete one internal filtering. But there are p such filters, right? Which means that overall the effective rate, right? The relationship between fs and fc is given by this complicated, uh, not complicated, but you know this uh, relationship that we have over here, which is fc is going to be fs into n divided by p, right? So both the fact that you can have some shared resources as well as parallelism can be exploited over here. Now, of course. Why would you do something like that? That's a different question, right? I've put in over here, it's a sort of flippant answer saying, ah, because we can. But the point is there can actually be situations where this becomes useful. And in practice, why that would happen is because you have the ability to trade off a certain amount of extra hardware for the parallelism. At the same time, you want to be able to run it using some degree of uh, resource sharing. One way of looking at it is you have a certain number of actual, you have a finite number of multiply accumulate units, 
present on your hardware, right? So if I have only a finite number of multiplier multiply accumulate units, then I might not be able to implement a very large filter with a large number of taps efficiently. Right? So then this effectively gives you an extra degree of flexibility in terms of the trade-offs that can be done. 